read for you what is known as the Beatitudes. To Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 3 to verse 12. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Realize, brothers and sisters, in this our short reading, that the Lord Jesus Christ is calling your attention to the kingdom of heaven in this long sermon. Now it is very important for you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ has come to preach the message concerning the kingdom of heaven. He came into this world with that in mind. As we read here, brothers and sisters, in chapter 3 and verse 2, that it is the same message brought to us by John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 3 and verse 2, we are told that the message of John the Baptist is summarized as, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And so it is, when the Lord Jesus Christ was presented to the world, we read there in chapter 4 of Matthew and verse 17, he says, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Similar to the words, word for word, the same message as John the Baptist. Now, brothers and sisters, when he started this long sermon that we have come to call the Sermon on the Mount, you realize that the focus, the attention that he's calling us to is once again on the same matter of the kingdom of God. Look at what he tells you there in chapter 5 and verse 3. He says that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You realize, the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 10 again, he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you turn, brothers and sisters, to verse 19, you will read these words concerning the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Even in a prayer, our Lord Jesus Christ taught His people to pray. You will realize there in chapter 6 and verse 10, He taught them to pray, Your kingdom. Whose kingdom again? God's kingdom. The kingdom of heaven come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 33, again, chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God, which is the same as the kingdom of heaven. Well, you have one more verse in verse 21, which I will not read for you. But brothers and sisters, you will find that the same message is given to us by the apostles. If you turn with me to the Acts of the Apostles, you will find that the apostles call our attention to the same matter. We read there, brothers and sisters, concerning our Lord first. If you look, go there to chapter 1 and verse 3 of the Acts of the Apostles, you read there these words, To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, had been seen by them during forty days, 
and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You can be assured therefore, brothers and sisters, that what goes on as it is recorded for us in the Acts of the Apostles, this book, you realize that it has got to do with the same theme, the kingdom of God of God. And that is definitely the case. If we go to chapter 8 for example, to chapter 8 of the uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8 and verse 12. You read that in chapter 8 and verse 12 these words. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God. You realize that the, Philip was preaching the message of gospel concerning the kingdom of God. You go there to chapter 20, to chapter 20, and look at what the apostles and the people in the book of the Acts of the Apostles were preaching. In chapter 20 and verse 25, similarly you read, And indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching, preaching what again? Preaching the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Now you go to the end of the Acts of the Apostles as you come to conclusion now concerning the life of the Apostle Paul and his ministry to chapter 28 of the Acts of the Apostles. Look at what you are told there in verse 23. In verse 23 it says, So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God. Verse 31, again, brothers and sisters, to the end it says, Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. Now, I have taken time, brothers and sisters, to bring your attention to this matter because it is important. It is important for you to realize that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to proclaim, to make known to you that He has come to bring you the kingdom of God. A kingdom of God, as we are learning here in the book of the Gospel of Matthew, it is known as the kingdom of heaven. Now, what do you mean by the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom, the word kingdom means the power, the dominion, the rule, the reign of a king. The king rule and reign over a, a territory, as you understand it. But it is not about a piece of land. It is more specifically, when you talk about the kingdom of God, it is talking about the authority of God to reign over a subject. A sphere of life, as you understand it here. So you look into this world and you also read about kingdoms, for example. The kingdom of Saudi Arabia or the kingdom of Thailand. Now, we often refer to Thailand as just Thailand. Where are you going? I'm going to visit Thailand. The official name is the kingdom of Thailand. And then you go to London, you are visiting the capital of the United Kingdom. It's a kingdom because it has a king reigning over that territory, that, that sphere, that, 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 in, that place of influence as you understand it. And the Lord Jesus Christ calls you to look at not Thailand, not Saudi Arabia, not England. He calls you to look at the kingdom of heaven. It is the same as the kingdom of God. For example, if you turn to the act, uh, to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1, and look at verse 15. What do you read there in verse 15? If you turn to the Gospel of Mark and verse chapter 1 and verse 15, you will find Mark recording the words, The kingdom of God has come near. Now in Matthew, it is the kingdom of heaven. But here, it is the kingdom of God. So it is used synonymously. Sometimes the Lord Jesus would say the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes he would say the kingdom of God. And so it is synonymous. It is interchangeable for these two things. It is about the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is about God. The kingdom of God. That is understood by the Gospels. If you go to the Gospel of Luke, you find the same thing in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. 
Look at verse 43. You find the same thing here in verse 43. But he said to them, It is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. So you see there, the kingdom of God, which is the same as the kingdom of heaven. They mean the same thing. It is referring to the same thing. It is just that the Lord Jesus sometimes says of heaven and sometimes he says of God. So it is, brothers and sisters, when you say that there is a kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven, you are saying that there is a king, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, God is king and God has appointed someone to be king. And throughout the Old Testament, it is clearly predicted and uh, proclaimed that the one that God is sending to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is going to come as a king. For example, if you turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, look at Matthew chapter 2, and look at what you are told there in verse 2, concerning the wise man who came looking for the star. What did he say? What did they say to Herod? He said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? King of the Jews. King born among the Jews. Born by the Jews. Not because he is the king of only the Jewish people, but he was born of all races of the Jewish stock. And that's what it means. So you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Look at what you are told of the confession of Nathaniel when he was told that the Messiah has come. Look at what he says in John chapter 1. And verse 49, he says, concerning the identity of the one he had come to know as the Messiah, you are the Son of God. You are the King. See, God has clearly predicted and foretold in the Old Testament, the Messiah will come as a King, the King of the Jews, the King of Israel. And Nathaniel here, he's just reflecting their understanding when he was introduced to the Lord as the Messiah, when he was convinced of that, he confessed him to be the king of Israel. you find the people saying the same thing. If you turn to the Gospel of John chapter 12, look at what you are told there of the people who welcomed the Lord into Jerusalem. In John chapter 12 and verse 12 to verse 13. The next day, when a large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And so you are told there, the King of Israel, which is predicted in Psalm 118 verses 25 to 26, a quotation by the people here. The same again, you go further down to John chapter 12, verses 14 to 15. Again, you find it say, quoting from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's court. You see there, brothers and sisters, the call to welcome, to behold the king, your king. And like how he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, sitting on a donkey. These were things written about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. And it was literally fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ came at specific specific point in his ministry and in his life. You see, brothers and sisters, when Christ promised that the kingdom of heaven is theirs, those who are poor in spirit. He is referring to the reign, to the reign of the promised Messiah. That is what he meant when he says that your kingdom come. That's what he wants you to pray for when you are to recite the Lord's Prayer. When you say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is very clear that when you say that the Lord Jesus Christ, His kingdom has come, it means that His will is accomplished. 
And therefore, if you say that you belong to God's kingdom, it means to say that in your life, God's reign is accomplished. You follow His rule. You are members of His kingdom. And therefore, you reflect His kingdom by obeying His rule. The rule of love. The rule that you find being taught clearly in the whole Bible. The rule to turn the other cheek. The rule to forgive one another even as Christ for God. For, uh, even for God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And things and things like that. The, the responsibility to obey the government God has appointed over you. Beloved brothers and sisters, that is what it means. When you say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You are participating in the rule of God in this world. So, as a Christian, there is much that you are to be conscious of. You know, sometimes we think that as a Christians, we live like the world. We follow the fashion and the pattern of the world, but not so. Now, I'm quite happy actually, or concerning what happened yesterday, it's reported in the news that there were just slightly above a thousand people who gathered at Hongling Park to, uh, to, 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 to celebrate the, uh, what has come to be the annual Pink Hot uh, carnival or whatever you have it, just slightly over a thousand people, which is much, much less than the thousands that they like to publicly uh, announce. They say, oh, how many people attended? They say, oh, in the thousands. It's not true, actually. It's not true. The reporter counted. It just barely, barely over a thousand people. So we thank God for that. But that's what we are praying for. Not because we hate them, but we do not want people, we do not want people to rebel against the rule of God. To, to, to say that your kingdom come is to say that we want God to rule over us. And if, we, if God is to rule over us, we must obey His rules. Because a kingdom, a country has rules. And therefore, beloved brothers and sisters, as Christians, we want people to obey the rules of God because we know it is safety. We know it's for their spiritual good, their eternal good, their earthly good as well. And so, when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we are actually saying that there is a, the rule of a king. And the king is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The second point we want to take note here is to find out this matter. What sort of kingdom is the kingdom of heaven? What sort of kingdom is it? Where will it be located? What will be the address of the kingdom of God? And what, where can we find the capital, the capital city of this kingdom? And immediately when we talk like this, we realize that this kingdom of heaven is unlike the kingdom we find in this world. Because when he was confronted, brothers and sisters, by the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, if you turn there to the Gospel of John, chapter 18, you hear the response from our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 36. He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. In other words, the Lord Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven is unlike any kingdom you find on earth. Why? Because it is a different sort of kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of the world is marked by the, the prestige displayed by the king in his gown, in, in his power over the military. He has a power to control the country. He has power to demand to be served and to be, to be paid homage to brothers and sisters. We are talking about a king in all his glory, like King Charles, like King Charles of England. But brothers and sisters, this is so different from the kingdom concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. His kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. His kingdom is unlike any kingdom on, on earth. His kingdom does not exist on a physical or earthly piece of land. Therefore, there is no such thing as London or Beijing 
or New Delhi or whatever you may call to be the capital city of this kingdom. Now there are some people who say that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the capital city is Jerusalem. It's not! That is what is wrong with many people trying to make uh, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ into a Jewish reality, but it's not true. That is definitely not what the Bible tells us about this. It's not a kingdom of this world. It is a spiritual kingdom. It is a kingdom about deliverance from sin, from darkness. It is a kingdom about being rescued out of this world in order to be part of this spiritual kingdom. If you turn to the book of Colossians, the Colossians chapter 1, look at what you are told there in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Colossians 1 and verse 13 says, he has rescued us from the domain, domains of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. The kingdom of the, the, His beloved Son as we, we read it in Romans chapter 14. Romans 14 and verse 17. Again you read, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You can be a citizen of God's kingdom and yet living in this world. You can be. Because this reign of God, this reign of Jesus Christ is about rescue from sin. It is about being, uh, being saved from this world into this spiritual reality. Even though, brothers and sisters, the people cannot see this kingdom. The people say, hey you! What do you mean by you are a member of God's kingdom? I cannot see. Of course they cannot see. Didn't what our Lord Jesus Christ tell Nicodemus? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see. But you can see. Why so? Because you are born from above. You are born by God. You are born again. And therefore it's very important, beloved brothers and sisters, to realize this. Most people in this world cannot see this kingdom. They cannot appreciate this kingdom. They cannot understand this kingdom. Why? Because they are not born of God. Only those who are born of God can see, can appreciate and want to be in this kingdom and seek to be in this kingdom. And I trust this morning that you are one of those. That though you are dazzled by the lights you are so attracted by the music of this world, but your heart seems to be leaping and stirred whenever you are reminded of that city, that kingdom, that king, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how you love that kingdom. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, and I offer you this kingdom, the kingdom of God. How wonderful it is, brothers and sisters. In this world, you have struggles, but in the kingdom of God, you have peace. So I call your attention this morning now to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at what you are told about this matter. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that you were born in a different kingdom? You were born in the kingdom of darkness until Jesus rescued you and saved you for the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 2, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Even another one in 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at what you are told there. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You will say from darkness into his marvelous light. And that's important, isn't it? You have a similar example in the Old Testament. You were born, as it were, as slaves in Egypt. You were under bondage to the power of the Egyptians. You were under their control. You had no rights. You were nothing. You were only slaves. 
until God came and sent Moses. And in the power of God, Moses saved all these slaves and brought them out of Egypt into the kingdom of God represented by the promised land. And so it is a picture that God wants us to learn from the Old Testament that spiritually that is the same picture. We are born into the power of sin. We are controlled by sin. We are under the influence of the devil and demons and Satan. And here comes Jesus Christ, the new Moses. He came in the power of God. He came to rescue us from the power of darkness and devil and sin. He came to save us from ourselves. But because inside of us we have the reign of sin and we are stuck. We are stuck. We are tied to sin. We are servants of sin. But He came and He came and He rescued us. Just like Moses, out of Egypt, we are rescued out of sin, out of darkness. And He brought us to His presence and He gives us the kingdom of God. And we are no longer in Egypt, in bondage. We are no longer slaves of sin. So, brothers and sisters, it's wonderful. No wonder if you are really a Christian, you behave differently from the world. You, you look like them, yes, you got two eyes, I hope, you got two ears, I hope, you have a head and a body, two hands and two legs, and you, 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 you need to eat like them, you, you need to drink water also like them, you go to school like them, but yet when you closely look at one another, you realize, eh, hey, we are different from them, hey, mommy, daddy, they, they talk differently from us. How come they talk like that? How can they behave like that? How can they support things like that? How can they do things like that? When you talk in this manner, you realize that you're different from them. Because there is something different about you. From them, you have a different heart. From them, you have a different king that you are serving. They serve the world, but you, you do not serve the world. You serve Jesus Christ. They listen to the world. They listen to sin. But who do you listen to? You listen to the Lord Jesus Christ who speaks to you from the Bible. That's why you want to read the Bible. Because in the Bible you read the voices of God speaks to you. Christ has come to save you from the power of of Satan and sin. That's what you are told. If you now turn with me, brothers and sisters, to Matthew chapter 9. Look at what you are told there. In Matthew 9, verses 12 to 13. Matthew 9, verses 12 to 13. Reading for you, uh, verses chapter 9, 12 to 13. It is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So we learn here what sort of kingdom it is. It is a kingdom that is different from the kingdom you find in this world because it is a spiritual kingdom. We come to the last point that I'm calling your attention to. The last point is this, brothers and sisters, that the kingdom of heaven belongs to the spiritually poor. That's what Jesus wants us to learn. He says, if you turn back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not anybody else, but them. You must be spiritually poor in order to belong to this kingdom. Spiritually poor, brothers, sisters, if that is the case, we will, if we are earnest, if we are sin believing, we will want to know, are we? Are we spiritually poor? Because if we are not spiritually poor, we cannot belong to this kingdom. What do you mean by spiritually poor? I hope that I have already explained to you last Sunday. To be spiritually poor is to realize that of your own, you cannot save yourself. 
You don't have money to buy the ticket into the kingdom. In yourself, there is nothing good that God should open the door of the kingdom for you. You cannot do it yourself. That's why you are poor. A poor person is a needy person. A poor person don't even have enough money to buy food. A poor person is needy. And that is what it means by spiritually poor. You need God to save you. You need God to open the door for you. You need God to bring you to this kingdom. That is what it means by spiritually poor. And that is what we learn here. I hope you remember. I read for you the, the picture, the example. If you turn with me again this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. Of the example of a person who is spiritually poor. And he knows it. And this is where what we are told about this spiritually poor person. In the Gospel of Luke 18, verses 13 to 14. Luke 18, verse 13 to verse 14. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest, saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this person went down to his house justified, rather than the other person, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Beloved brothers and sisters, you have to ask yourself this morning, do you have this same experience here? When you think of God, that God is holy, God is perfect, God is good, when you think of the responsibility, the duty that God calls you, and God created you to perform, and you have not done any of them, beloved brothers and sisters, do you feel the same way as this tax collector? banging his chest and say, Oh, I'm condemned, I'm condemned. Oh, God, who can save me? Who can save me? I cannot save myself. Who can save me? It is such a person who knows that he is bad. He is really bad. And that he needs help. Do you need help? It is a proud person who will not see a doctor when he is sick. It is a proud person who know, who think that he can save himself that will not go and see a doctor. But if you know you're sick, you know that you cannot help yourself, you really need help, you seek a doctor. You need a medicine. You need a doctor to tell you how to get better. Because you know that you are sick and that you are not a doctor. Some doctor also cannot help themselves. Why? Right? Because not all doctors are specialists in every part of the human uh, uh, body and the doctors of who are in need of specialization will need to see a specialist in that area. So, brothers and sisters, we need to think about all these things. Do you, do you have this spirit? Jesus says that they must be born again, who are those who are spiritually poor. And that is what we are told when Nicodemus was asked, are you born again? Except a man be born again, except a woman be born again, except a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, I have started this morning's sermon by asking you, do you know the kingdom of heaven? And I try to my best to describe for you that the kingdom of God is different from the kingdom you find in this world. A kingdom refers to the reign of king. Whose king do you belong to? Whose king do you want to belong to? Is it King Jesus, who is such a lovely and wonderful king? How he himself humbled himself to come into this world to rescue his own citizens and people. Who else have you heard in history that a king risked his own life to save his people? Who else can you recall or can you list as an example of a king who actually risked his own life and gave his own life in, in order to save those who belong to him. That is a king that people admire, that is a king that people will willingly subject themselves to serve. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He came into this world, he loved his people so much that for them he died. He died for them. 
He gave his life in exchange for their lives. And therefore this morning, beloved brothers and sisters, you have to ask yourself, do you belong to him? Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15 says, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's how Paul described the Lord Jesus Christ. He attributed to the Lord Jesus Christ such high honour and such high praises and such high titles because Paul loved the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember how Paul became a Christian? He hated the name of Jesus. He was all out to destroy Christianity. He was all prepared to go even all the way, traveling from Jerusalem to the northern city of Damascus in order to destroy anybody who claimed to be a Christian. And yet, while he was halfway to the city, he saw a light shining and how the light spoke to him and how the light identified himself, the voice saying, I am Jesus whom you persecuted. And as a result of that, he became blind. Paul couldn't see anything. He had to be held into the place where he had gone to persecute Christians. And there he was fasting for three days. He couldn't see anything. And he was really in prayer begging for the Lord Jesus Christ whom he hated to save him. And the Lord sent another man called Ananias and told Ananias to go and do what he sent Ananias to do for Paul. And Ananias said, no, 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 Lord. Hey, I heard so much about this man. He, he hates Christian. He has come to Damascus to persecute Christian. And now you are sending me to go and heal him? And the Lord Jesus said, Go, I sent you, because he's a chosen vessel. So Ananias, in obedience to the Lord Jesus, went and healed the Apostle Paul from blindness. And he became a great apostle, as you know him, recorded in the Holy Bible. How did the greatest persecutor become the greatest apostle and promoter of Christianity? Well, because he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of us here this morning, young or old, we must also have this encounter. I want to ask you this morning, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as the Apostle Paul knew him? Have you had an encounter with him? Have you come to a point in your life where you say, I cannot save myself, I come to realize this, and there is an awesome spiritual struggle in me. A conviction of my own sin that I'm so sinful and so unworthy. And at the very same time, great uh, adoration of the Lord Jesus Christ. Realizing that only Him is worthy. Him that He alone has a power to save sinners. Beloved brothers and sisters, that is how a person enters the kingdom of heaven. And that is how you enthrone the King. King Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and I trust that it is true to you. Let us pray.